Hey friends, Andy Jenkins with the Warrior Hope Podcast brought to you by Crosswinds Foundation for Faith and Culture, where what we do here is endeavor to connect veterans to their next mission. Now, people say, why do you hold the paper up? I hold it up because it makes it easy to see it. And remember, we connect veterans to their next mission. Now, the most common obstacles that we face on that are isolation and unresolved hurts, or you could even say, uh, spell it out like this. In fact, I'm going to do this on the sheet right now and say unprocessed pain of the past. So unresolved hurts, it could be unprocessed pain of the past, it could be a common obstacle right there. My, my writing is incredible. I'll, I'll have to rewrite that in another week or so. Here, here's why it matters. We really believe that all of this matters because you have a purpose and that purpose most often connects you to people, people who are going to be radically affected, incredibly blessed by what you do, by you living out the mission. Those people always include, now it's bigger than this, but they include your family, they include your friends, they include your fellow service members. In the previous episode, we talked about the new documentary that Eugene Cuevas has been putting together on behalf of Front Porch Media and Crosswinds Foundation for Faith and Culture. And how that is really going to be a groundbreaking I feel project I would encourage you to go back and listen to that this always 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 affects your family and the people who are closest to you now this week I want to shift gears a little bit and I'm gonna bring you a teaching from the Warrior Hope curriculum this is the first curriculum that we put together. This is the project that was the result of the Invisible Scars documentary, the result of the Honoring the Code documentary. And when you flip through here in the beginning, early on, we start tackling the ideas of total health. And that includes spiritual health, it includes emotional health, it includes mental health. That first one is in chapter three, spiritual health. It really zeroes in on this topic of moral injury, the subject of the Honoring the Code documentary. Put the link in the show notes below. And I really wanted to share it with you. Uh, over the next few weeks, I have some interviews scheduled where we're going to talk about just war. We're going to talk about how should soldiers view the idea of having to pull a gun and uh, take life in the line of duty? How, how should they view themselves? And where does that fall on the moral compass? We're going to talk with some people who've dealt with survivor skill. We're going to talk with others where their, their battle buddies didn't make it uh, from the scene, but they did. And how should you deal with that? And in order to go there, I really thought, I need to provide you with some information that will really set the stage for those conversations, as well as information where after you hear those stories, you can always come back here and visit. So in this episode right here, I'm going to share with you the teaching video from lesson number three of Warrior Hope. Uh, it also comes in the Warrior Hope Leader Guide. This conversation right now is all about guilt and shame. How do you deal with the official name is moral injury. The main idea is this, while post-traumatic stress can cause emotional disruptions, many of them are actually the result of moral injury. So we're going to introduce a new idea in this lesson. We talked about post-traumatic stress disorder. Now we're going to actually talk about moral injury. So a lot of the emotional disruptions are actually the result of moral injury is what we're saying. If such emotional trauma is treated as PTSD, the treatment will be ineffective. It must be considered and it must be approached differently. Okay, so here's, here's what I just said, and here's where we're going in this lesson, is we have two different issues now that we're dealing with. One is post-traumatic stress disorder. The second is moral injury. These are both wounds on the soul, and one of these we're saying uh, looks like, feels like uh, post-traumatic stress that we've just defined with the fight or flight, with the hypervigilance and the re-avoidance and the re-experiencing syndromes. And the, we've talked about that in the previous lesson. This other one is what we're going to refer to as moral injury. And so in this lesson, let me really just, let me just kind of lead you in it this way. Uh, 
Think about signs that you see out on the road. You, you see them when you're driving. You see them when you're uh, when you're jogging. I see them when I'm when I'm riding my bike. You know where it says, uh, "Please share the road." You know, telling cars to share the road with bikes like me, right? So you, you see signs everywhere. You see them when you go to the restroom. You see them when you're at the supermarket. When you're looking for s signs, are not about the signs themselves. Signs are always pointing to a greater reality. Signs are always informing us. They're encouraging us to navigate, to look deeper, or to avoid something, perhaps. Signs are always pointing to a different reality. The sign is not about the sign itself. So you think about this sign right here that says uh, danger mines. Uh, th this one's actually quite common in many places around the world. In fact, there's a lot of humanitarian causes that are dealing specifically with this sign. Now, if you were in a field and you came upon this sign, and it's just like you see in the picture right there, you know, on a post with barbed wire and the sign says danger mines, you've really got three choices when you face that sign. First choice is this. You can ignore the sign, you can proceed, and you can hope for the best. Uh, choice number two is you could accept that sign as truth and, and then you could just walk through that field with caution. Uh, choice number three was you, you could just stop and you could go around the field, you could take another route. And so when I'm teaching this in a group, I always say, hey, what would you do? And people inevitably have different answers based on these three. Uh, nobody says they would ignore the sign. Everybody acknowledges that that one is like, we, we wouldn't do that. We would scratch that one off because we wouldn't just kind of barrel through. But people disagree about number two. They say, well, I might go through the field depending on what was in the field. Like if there was family that was in the field or if there was someone I was trying to rescue or save or something I needed to get to that was super important, I, I might go through the field instead of going around the field. But everybody agrees that they would accept that sign in some sense as true, that it pointed to a bigger reality beyond the sign, that that sign was saying, hey, there is all kinds of danger all throughout this field, and then we would navigate however we chose to navigate. But again, we would all agree that that sign is not about the sign itself. The sign is a pointing to a different reality. Now, let's just kind of put that on the screen here, okay, because we're about to make a leap and talk about this is how it relates to you and me and what's going on inside the soul, okay? You don't make the sign the focus of your attention. Any of the signs that you see, we know that these signs aren't about the sign themselves. The sign are always pointing to something greater. And I would say this, physical symptoms, they call our attention to look closer. So uh, if you woke up this morning and you rolled over in the sheet and just kind of where your arm was, you saw some blood you know, you'd, you'd kind of go, oh, what, what happened? Um, that sign would call you to look closer. If, if you got up and you felt uh, a little faint, a physical symptom, you felt a little dizzy, you'd probably sit down like that sign would call you to look and go deeper. Uh, one time my daughter Miriam, she was on a zip line in her backyard and she, she fell and instantly she starts crying. I dusted her off and we went upstairs. I let her take a bath. And after about an hour of just kind of soaking in the bath, she said that her arm was not feeling right. So I gave her some Advil to really knock out the swelling, but I took her to the emergency room to get an x-ray and found out she had just a slight fracture. That sign that was going on, the, the, the pain that was in the arm, that alerted me to something deeper that without that sign, I would not have known about. In all cases, physical symptoms, we don't make it about the symptom itself. We don't make the, the, the pain in the arm just the pain. We, we look deeper. We don't make the blood just about, oh, there's blood. Like we, we look deeper. We don't make the dizziness just about, oh, there's just it. Like we actually look deeper to see what's going on. Well, in the same way, these emotional and these mental signs, these symptoms, they do the exact same thing. They're letting us know that there's something going on in the soul that we need to navigate, something going on in the soul that we need to address. Here's, here's point number two. Let me remind you of this. This is something that we continue coming back to, but it's super important for you to, to really lock on to, is when you have some kind of sign that's emotionally or mentally something of distress, something that kind of feels a little bit off, something that feels not healthy, something that feels like maybe not normal, or maybe it's a new normal that you know was not the original normal. Let me remind you that you're not flawed. 
the internal unrest that you feel, it is a natural response to the experience that you've encountered, especially if it was a traumatic experience. Now, as it relates to moral injury, as it relates to spiritual health, let me show you how that wraps up here. Let's define conscience like we defined post-traumatic stress disorder uh, several lessons ago. And let me just go to a source right here that everyone would know. The source is Webster's. Uh, conscience is this. Now, now notice, I'm going to make a few observations as we look at the slide here and just point out some things. Conscience is the sense of consciousness, the sense of awareness of the moral goodness or blameworthiness of one's own. Now, catch this conduct, what you do, your intentions, what you felt like you should have done but didn't do, or what you felt like you should not have done, but you, okay, so it, intentions, so it could be what you did, what you thought about doing or thought about not doing, or character, so character would really kind of be a life path of, of repeated behaviors, repeated conducts, repeated intentions, or character together with a, now notice this, a feeling of obligation to do right or to be good. So the conscience has a propensity to do what's right, to do what's good, to do what's pure, noble, trustworthy, reliable, honorable, with integrity. But, but what's going on here is so often there, there seems to be this, this break in it. There seems to be something that gets kind of shifted and sifted down. You, you might have seen it presented like this before. If you grew up like I did, you got up watching the real Saturday morning cartoons. Uh, they shifted somewhere when I was in high school, but before then, like they notably had these characters on just about every Saturday on somebody's shoulders where you'd have the angel and the devil and they're arguing back and forth and the cartoon characters looking back and forth and this one's trying to encourage this behavior, this one's trying to encourage that behavior, and they're kind of topsy-turvy about what are they going to do, and there is this real conscience inside of us. And what that definition from Webster's is saying is that the propensity is actually to follow the angel and to do right. Like there is this bent. What, what's interesting is several years ago, decades ago, uh, C.S. Lewis, the writer of the Chronicles of Narnia, he actually studied different human cultures. And he said, you know, like there seems to be like no matter where you go, and no matter who you study, and no matter what era the culture's from, there seems to be like this stack pole, this list of certain traits that just seem to be, he actually called it the law of God written on the human heart, where there's just, it was his moral argument, basically, that anywhere you go, killing's wrong. That anywhere you go, stealing's wrong. That, that anywhere you go, regardless of how let me, let me just kind of use this term, feminist the culture is, or how patriarchal the culture is, regardless uh, that men still give up seats for women and children. There seem to be certain things that are always these norms. Now, we can value judge them or whatever we want to do about them, but there seem to be things that are consistent. And he linked that back to conscience. And he says that there is this certain way of doing things that's kind of just the way we are created. It is hardwired into the fabric of creation. Now, as far as that goes as military, let me show you this video from Dr. Rita Brock. She's an expert on moral injury, and she's gonna help you see what happens when you get into the military, and then suddenly that moral compass gets, gets broken. I define moral injury as the impact on a person's sense of meaning and values and their basic moral foundations when they're in situations where they have to violate their core values. That can come from something they did, something they failed to do, or something they witnessed. You're raised a certain way and you have certain values, certain concepts that you grow up to learn and understand what is right and wrong. Now, you grow up and then you join the military, all right? The first time I actually had a human being in a peep sight, I blinked and I thought to myself, every day of my life I've been taught that thou shalt not kill and I'm about to end this guy's life and I pulled the trigger. 
And I can tell you this, it gets easier and easier as you do it more and more. And the, the more you do it and the easier it gets, the worse you feel. Moral injury is not necessarily the result of immoral actions on the battlefield. Uh, the reality is that good people often have bad outcomes. Good people who make good decisions, who make right moral decisions, sometimes uh, experience devastating consequences. When a person is traumatized, um, when events occur, whether they be in a war zone or operations other than war, that begin this process of, of suffering that some people call post-traumatic stress, some people call it the moral injury, I think what happens is that they're, they are unable to accommodate um, this change in their worldview. And it begins this process of suffering. And, and everyone who has suffered knows that there are aspects of suffering that are physical and there are aspects of it that are anguish, that are, um, that are mental. I think there can be a tendency to misunderstand the connection between moral injury and PTSD, often seeing them as the same thing, which they're not. There are a number of connecting points, but they're not the same thing. Only since the end of 2009 that there's been an attempt to, to pull PTSD and moral injury apart and distinguish them because they overlap so intensely a lot of the time. Post-traumatic stress disorder is caused by an external event over which the person has no, no control. Moral injury, on the other hand, is an internalized situation. Moral injury is when you are a part of some kind of act or event that so violates your moral code that results in deep sense of shame, guilt, in questioning of oneself, one's belief systems, and what you have always known to be right and good in the world. Moral injury hurts the most is because we feel like we've done something wrong. And we don't know how to change that because we can't change the past. We want to ask questions like, um, should we have been there? Um, was it okay that those children got killed? Um, what about those women who are being treated so badly in that culture? Um, was my leadership um, good? Um, were they, you know, you know, did they make mistakes? Did America make mistakes? You know, they want to ask these existential questions and these questions that are very difficult. I feel that they have done such bad things that they cannot be forgiven for it. That if people knew what they did, uh, they would be totally rejected, that nobody can love them, and in fact that God doesn't love them. Uh, some veterans carry this to the point that they can never forgive themselves. They don't feel like anyone else can forgive them if they were ever to hear the story. Some think that even God can't forgive them. That's a tremendous weight to carry. I simply ask veterans who are experiencing this a simple question. If one of your battle buddies shared with you the exact same experience and said he had that, and said, could you forgive me, would you? In every instance, the veteran responds, of course I would forgive him. He's my brother. The main approach for moral injury is not a medical doctor with drugs, but rather it's the forgiveness and grace of a moral authority, a loving God, the counseling of clergy and sensitive therapists, and the fellowship of a spiritual community offering hope and help and wrapping their arms around veterans and helping them. Let me highlight something that she was referring to. Dr. Brock, and she's so brilliant and so articulate, actually, she says this, moral injury results when soldiers violate their core moral beliefs. In evaluating their behavior negatively, they feel they can no longer live in a reliable, meaningful world and can no longer be regarded as decent human beings. They may feel this even if what they did was warranted or unavoidable. So, so you think about a situation where you've grown up to, to protect people and you, you shouldn't even fight on the playground, certainly shouldn't kill. And then all of a sudden, because of the call of duty, you must kill. And in fact, you, you have to because you're actually protecting lives. You're protecting other people from being killed precisely because you're able to do what 
violates the moral compass. Or think about people who have survivor's guilt. This would be one area of it because they, they thought they should have been there to save or to handle or to rescue and then they couldn't or maybe they even took a shot at it but they, they were unable to do so and so now they feel less than human. She continues, the consequences of violating one's conscience, even if you had to, even if you were ordered to, even if you were in in, an impossible situation that was a no-win situation, even if the act was unavoidable or seemed right at the time, those consequences, she says, can be absolutely devastating. So here's what I want to do is in the same way that we could look at the signs related to PTSD, I want to show you the signs, the symptoms related to moral injury. Point number three is this, moral injury, it manifests as feelings of guilt and shame. Now, let me point out on the screen here, PTSD and moral injury, they're similar, but they're actually different. In fact, we we actually have two different documentaries. Documentary number one, Invisible Scars, is about PTSD. PTSD uh, actually manifests as feelings uh, of uh, fight or flight response, where where you're you're gonna face it or you're gonna you're gonna run from it and hide it. And that's because in post-traumatic stress disorder, you're reacting largely to an external threat. The threat is out there. It is mortar fire that is out there. It is a person that is threatening you that is out there. It is a traffic accident or a natural disaster or a terrorist act, just going back to our definition, that is out there. Moral injury, and the documentary Honoring the Code covers that one. Moral injury, it manifests as feelings of guilt and shame. And that's because when it's moral injury, it's not something that's out there, it's actually in here. Now it certainly relates to real world experience and the things that happened out there, but all of a sudden because of what happened out there, there is something internal that is this unrest. And so when you see, when you sense the signs, just as we saw the sign of the minefield, when you see the sign that that says guilt, and you see the sign in your soul that says shame, you might be dealing with moral injury. Now now notice this on this graphic here. There are common symptoms with both moral injury and PTSD. Uh, With both of them for sure you'll you'll fear anger. I'm just going through the middle of the slide. Anger, anxiety, depression. These are common symptoms. Uh, Insomnia, sleeplessness, nightmares, uh, self-medication. And and that could be self-medication with alcohol or drugs. That could be self-medicating with with sex, with uh, over-exercise, with with throwing yourself into anything to avoid and to numb out what's really going on. It it could result in a symptom of of, of withdrawing. so, So both of these, they look on the surface very similar but I want you to notice, look, look on the left back at moral injury, guilt and shame, uh, because the conscience, that moral code was violated is number one. Number two, you feel, as Dr. Brock said, less unworthy, less than human. That is a spiritual and emotional wound. Look on the far right side, uh, PTSD, that's the fight or flight. It's external hypervigilance, number two, re-experiencing symptoms, number three, avoidance symptoms, number four, negative feelings, that's because this one is mental or emotional. Moral injury, the threat is internal. PTSD, the threat is external. Moral injury, spiritual. PTSD, emotional. Now, I want to show you a video clip where you can actually see the interplay of these in real life. When we were shooting the documentary, Invisible Scars, um, there was a veteran that we were able to talk with, and he knew that something was not right. He actually went to the VA seeking a diagnosis. Rather than fearing the diagnosis, he actually wanted one because he was desperate to get help. He was dealing with things that you see in the middle of the chart there. He He was dealing with anger, anxiety depression, insomnia, just this overwhelming sense of of self-medicating and withdrawing and lashing out, as he'll say, in anger. But when he went in to receive the diagnosis, they did not diagnose him. He was not diagnosable with post-traumatic stress disorder. Here's what we think. As we were making the second film, Honoring the Code, and really began to learn more and more about moral injury, we actually think that he's dealing with moral injury, not post-traumatic stress disorder. So the VA was correct. He did not have PTSD. He had moral injury. Watch this video and see if that makes sense to you. 
at the VA one day. I was down there in the dentist's office, and there happened to be an older man in there that was in Vietnam. Uh, and I had been struggling, and uh, he went to talking about some stuff he had experienced in Vietnam one day. And he, as he was telling about it, he started crying. I started crying with him. And he said, it's just like it was yesterday. And y'all, I don't know, when I left out of there, I was like, okay, Lord, I, I'm all right. <laughs> it's okay to cry about this stuff. The stuff happened. It's okay. And you live and you breathe it. It's in your clothes. It's in your body. I've come back off patrol before and tried to brush my teeth or whatever. I actually took a going in and shower off to get some of the stuff, just get it away. I smoked more cigarettes than I ever thought about, and good gracious, that didn't even cover it up. <laughs> and uh, he just wanted to get away from it. Uh, but anyways, make a long story, I'm the one that's changed. It changed me. It changed me. It gave me a very different perspective on stuff because I saw some really ugly, ugly things. I will dis have discussed it with regular folks, uh, very s sensitive with in other words, I sensitize what I said because I've discovered I've got to watch what I say because you've got to watch what you put in somebody's mind because they may not get it out. pseudo guilt stuff or whatever they call it, it's real. It, and it'll get you sometimes before you feel like you're nothing and you just want to be somewhere else. Uh, I know back in the past, I've said stuff to my ex-wife. <sighs> I've done stuff or I may have hollered at the kids or little stuff that maybe shouldn't make a hill of beans. But in my mind, it did because I would think, what would Sergeant Spicer have done with this opportunity? What would Sergeant Crockett, what would he have done with this? Or Sergeant Tanner? And you feel like a failure. Oh. And it's sometimes hard, hard to see it. Sometimes people say stuff down to me and they, they don't even know they don't have to. I've already heard enough of it from myself. Again, to summarize, the signs that are associated with moral injury are these two that we're going to put on the screen right here. It's that guilt and shame, and, and the result is the conscience feels violated. The conscience, the moral compass there, that human code, it's, it's broken. And, and in some sense, like the angel has been shoved off the shoulder um, and might have had to have been because of a real-world circumstance. It might have actually been completely unavoidable or order, something that had to occur. And there's this sense, there's this feeling of unworthiness. Again, it's spiritual and it's emotional. The guilt and shame, let me break these down for you and show you the difference here. Guilt is based on, it's an action, it's, it's I did something. Uh, so I pulled the trigger. I uh, did not rescue that person. I could have gone in and I didn't. I, you, you just fill in the blank. I don't want to be too specific because the wounds are unique to all of us. We all have different experience and we all encounter that differently. But guilt is based on an action. If you look in the far right column there, it says described in detail. It's something you do. It, it might be out of character for you or it might be something that was based solely on the circumstance that you faced. Um, shame has to do not with action but your identity. It, it actually says, I am something. So shame moves even deeper. It's, it's not, I did a bad thing. It is, I am a bad thing. And if you look in that far right column, as we just kind of want to draw that out a little bit more, it, it really gets to not something you do, it gets to who you are. Again, it's different than doing a bad thing. This denotes that you're a bad person, perhaps not even valued uh, as being human. Um, again, here's how it feels. It feels depressed, it feels guilty. Uh, worthless, uh, remorse that you can't overcome, a sense of despair, unable to connect with others emotionally because you're carrying around this weight, um, even uh, feeling suicidal. Now one thing, one story that we continue hearing is uh, from veterans, they can always remember if they had to pull the trigger and kill someone, they can remember that. 
And so let, let me show you just kind of the raw emotion. This is one of our friends, JT Cooper, who was involved in the actual Black Hawk Down event uh, in Mogadishu. Let me, let me show you how he termed this. A couple of weeks, month or two before that, the first time I was asked to fire, I uh, asked my lieutenant three times. He's like, Cooper, take that guy out. Sir, you want me to, you want me to kill this guy? Yes, Cooper, fire. Sir, are you sure? I'm a 60, I, I got the big gun, I got, sir, are you sure you want me to take this guy out? Took me three tries, pull the trigger. Not that I was hesitating, it's just this was broad daylight. This guy's taking pot shots at us from a crowd. And I got asked to kill him. It's not easy. I think that might help you put flesh on the tension that you feel there. Um, there there's another uh, veteran that we spoke with. His name is Kyle Radke. He's an Air Force captain. And he, he says this about his experience in war. He says, I started having questions. What was the war for? Did I do any good for this? Could we have done something differently? Did, did we have to, you know, did I make a difference in this war? More, more importantly, I ask myself, should I have stayed out of the war and would anything be different? Would everything be better for me if I had? Okay, you sense that the angel shoved off. Now we've, we've kind of walking in different territory. No amount of medicine, no amount of therapy, nothing worked. The doctors didn't have an answer to that. No prescription can answer those questions. The only thing I can do is really work with other veterans or chaplains and try and get those answers. Do you see? What he's dealing with is, is not fight or flight. He's actually dealing with something internal because it's this guilt, it's this shame, it's this consciousness that has been violated, and now he's questioning his worth, his value as a human being. Well, that leads me to point number four as we start wrapping up this lesson. Point number four is this, experts of multiple diverse backgrounds. And, and let me just kind of highlight right there, some of these experts are religious, some of them are not. So it's that varied. All experts, I would say, agree on this common cure. And, and the cure is, oddly enough, it's, it's this. It's uh, forgiveness is the freedom. Forgiveness is freedom. Now, the hindrance to forgiveness is this, is in order to be forgiven of something, you actually have to admit, you have to own the thing, you have to place it out there. And so the hindrances to forgiveness are, are guilt. It's that idea that I did something so horrible, it can't be forgiven. I did something so horrible that what if people actually found out about this? And shame, I am horrible. What if people even knew this about me? But what we've seen is, is this, and what we've been learning from different experts is this, is the forgiveness can come from a pastor, it can come from a priest or a rabbi, it can come from a former coach, it can come from an officer that the veteran served under, it can come from a battle buddy that they served with, it can come from someone else that they perceive to be an authority. But it happens when they're able to get that skeleton out of the closet and that person is actually to say, I see what you did and you're released of it. I see who you are and you're more than that. You're better than that. I still see the image of the creator upon you and there still is this destiny, this call of greatness for your life. A couple years ago, I was uh, meeting with a friend. I used to meet with him once a week to get coffee. We would put the young kids into bed and I'd just meet up at the coffee shop. Like at night, at nine o'clock was really the only time that he and I could connect. And so uh, we would just do that. And I remember one day we sat down and he actually said, hey, there, there's like something I gotta tell you. Like there's something that I did years ago and nobody knows, not even my wife, but like it's been weighing me down and I've gotta get it off my chest. Now, you see right there? He wasn't dealing with PTSD. He wasn't dealing with the fight or flight issue. He was dealing with moral injury. He was dealing with guilt, with shame that he had hidden from the person who was closest to him even. And he said, like, I've just got to tell you. And so I said, well, man, like, you know, I'm for you. Uh, I've known him for years. 
been through ups and downs and you know man rocky parts of life like tell, tell me tell me what's going on and I remember he sat there and he stuttered his way through it for a moment and then as he opened up the door and began talking he got more and more out and then finally I just listened and he got it all out I remember looking him in the eye afterwards and I remember saying that that's it and it wasn't a small thing that he said but I remember just kind of thinking like you've been carrying that around and I told him you've been carrying that around for years by yourself and you've not let anybody know that to where you could be released from it. And these were his words. He says, well, when the skeleton was in the closet, it seemed a lot bigger. It seemed a lot scarier because that, this was his analogy, because that skeleton was like leaning up against the closet door and it seemed like it was just big and it was bold and it was strong. But when I opened the door just now, the skeleton just collapsed and there was no muscle there was no sinew, there was no tendon, there was no ligament, there was no breath, there was no life. It was just bones, clutter on the floor. And when you get to get bones and clutter on the floor, then the process of cleanup can begin. Now, I'll be honest with you, the first time I come from a faith background, the first time that I heard uh, this whole notion that anybody could offer forgiveness, I remember just thinking like, that doesn't make sense, like a coach could forgive? Or like a a, a, a sergeant could forgive like you might have heard that in Crutchfield's story in the video or just anyone else could forgive but then I remember the stories from the New Testament where Jesus actually forgave sins like one time it happened in Mark chapter 2 where they let the paralytic down through the roof while he's teaching in the crowd and he's there and Jesus says uh, son your sins are forgiven and the Pharisees were mad. They were furious about it. Just as I was like, kind of questioning, like, what, just the coach can forgive sins? And he healed the man in response and said, which is easier, rise and walk. So Jesus in that moment forgave sins. But then this interesting thing happens in the upper room after the resurrection. He actually looks at the disciples in the book of John and he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. And in that moment, he actually empowered his people to express grace to each other. In fact, if you look at the end of the New Testament, James says, confess the issues that you have. Confess the stuff that you carry to each other so that you may be healed. Like healing comes not just in this, I'm going to have this spiritual encounter by myself. Sometimes true healing happens when we express grace to one another. As we close out, watch this video from really an expert on moral injury, Major General James Mukuyama. So there was an incident that occurred in the Mekong Delta when I was a company commander uh, in Vietnam and we had just overrun an enemy position. And we had killed several enemy. And as a matter of fact, literally, I had three bodies of Viet Cong at my feet. And the time a unit is most vulnerable is right after a victory. Now, I was the guy in charge. I was the professional, and I knew that. So I was on my radio talking to my platoon leaders because I was a company commander, and I had two, 200 soldiers I was in charge of. And so I'm talking to my platoon leaders, and I'm uh, kicking rear end and taking names, as we say. And I told my platoon leaders, Reorganize your units, take care of your wounded, redistribute your ammunition, look for enemy avenues of approach. Now, while I'm doing all of this, suddenly I stop and I look at the bodies at my feet and I realize that something had happened to me. Something had hardened my heart. Only moments earlier, these were alive human beings. These were people who had families, they had loved ones, they had emotions, they were fighting for something as important to them as I was fighting for it. I was treating them like bumps on a log. And then I remembered Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when he told us to pray for our enemies. So in the middle of all this stuff going on, the so-called fog of battle, I stopped and I said a prayer for the three Viet Cong and their families. And now that I look back on it, I know I was praying for myself as much as I was praying for them.
thank you so much for joining us today. Again, I'm Andy Jenkins with the Warrior Hope Podcast, where every week we endeavor to connect veterans to their next mission. The obstacles, the enemies that we're trying to overcome and fight now are isolation and the hurts, the unprocessed pain of the past. And we really feel it's important for you to identify and walk in that next mission because you have a purpose and that purpose always radically, dramatically affects people, including your family, your friends, and fellow service members. The people who had your six before, whose six you had, now they still have your six, you still have theirs, and you're going to become instrumental in helping each other, not only identify, but also walk out that purpose. And a lot of that has to do with the topic of moral injury. Now, I, I kind of feel odd bringing you three takeaways from a talk that I gave, but, but, but I'm actually going to do it anyway, uh, maybe just as a recap. If you're on social media, if you're watching on YouTube, we'd love for you to subscribe. We'd love for you to share this off with someone else and give us your best takeaway on social media. Here's number one, moral injury is different than PTSD. And so moral injury is one issue. PTSD, as we highlighted in this talk, is a different issue. That leads me to point number two, you must address the hurt that you want to heal. If it's PTSD, you've got to address it as PTSD. If it's moral injury, you've got to address it as moral injury, which leads you to that topic that we ended with, which was the idea, the notion of forgiveness. Number three, final takeaway is this, and I would love for you to take us up on this. Freedom is still found when you gain courage and you step into the light. If we can assist you in stepping into the light, I would love for you to reach out to us. Join one of the Warrior Hope groups that are occurring right now via Zoom. A link is below in the show notes where you can get all of the information there. If you just need someone to talk to, you can schedule an appointment with us below and we are happy to converse with you and would love to point you to resources to help you take the next best steps for you. Again, I'm Andy Jenkins. This is the Warrior Hope Podcast. I'm signing off. I'll see you again next week. Thank you.